Okay, so uh, thank you again, everyone, for coming here today. Uh, what I want to do today is to, in this very short space, uh, seek to bring together some of the themes that have emerged so far. Um, and I think I want to really uh, start with the, um, the emphasis that Ray had in his talk, you know, of really trying to capture the person, the person behind uh, the diagnosis. Um, uh, philosophically, I think of this as the, the significance of the, what you may call the moral self or the agent, uh, the one who, who is there all along and whose task it is to manage uh, your condition for, for the future. Um, I also want to echo Alison's uh, insightful remarks about the possible genesis in this. Um, um, I won't go into my own history here uh, today, uh, but uh, suffice it to say that concepts surrounding inter inter intergenerational trauma uh, and um, narratives that have been in some sense passed down upon you is also the one that can affect very real trauma for, for, uh, for patients. So um, even though the talk is going to be fairly theoretical, I want us to think of these concepts with sympathy uh, in a co-creative way. Uh, it's precisely uh, this, uh, this importance of moving away from various othering problems that we see Pluralized contrast between, on the one hand, the establishment and the uh, and so forth. So that's one thing that I want us all to think uh, together about today. And uh, I think I want to start uh, with uh, a reminder that, as it were, the establishment isn't all uh, about pathologizing persons. Uh, this uh, is a slide that is taken from the World Psychiatric Association's own uh, position statement on what is to be, uh, what is expressed as the kind of new challenges for the psychiatrists of the 21st century. And what you find on this list here is, I think, all items that, um, that point towards uh, a reappraisal of uh, self-management, but also a strong sense of uh, patient empowerment, um, and doing so uh, as a way of, um, um, of enabling the patient, as one of the items is stating here. So the language here is very much one of facilitating recovery. And the, the, uh, the item that I want to focus in on today is specifically this notion of, uh, of the role of the patient and the team in recovery. Um, and the emphasis of team here, I think we can use uh, by extension as a task that uh, uh, brings with it a holistic conception of society as a whole. Um, if you think of the, uh, the biosocial determinants of uh, 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 mental health and illness, uh, there is no, it's no exaggeration to say that it is uh, a wider systemic approach is very much overdue. One that I personally think of one as um, expanding or indeed moving the quote-unquote illness out of the patient and uh, thinking further about the wider opportunities for the, the self behind the diagnosis and doing so in an essentially relational manner, whereby it's the, uh, the social context that is one that needs to change in some way. Okay, so uh, on that note, here is just a, here is a, a, a an excerpt, uh, just a reminder uh, on this uh, idea of hope in recovery. Uh, this is a quotation from Hannah Pickard uh, uh, in her uh, essay, Stories of Recovery, the role of narrative and hope in overcoming PTSD 
and personality disorder. And I picked this because of its emphasis of narrative as an ongoing and open-ended process. So, and I, I will quote this at full length. Good practice in care demands that clinicians do whatever they can to help patients tell their own stories with hope in order to best promote recovery. The most straightforward way of doing this is for clinicians to hold hope themselves for their patients, to believe in their patients' powers of choice and agency and their capacity to recover and lead a better life. Communicating this belief, persisting in it despite lack of good evidence and in face of the patient's own resistance or despair, and trusting the patients even when their patients do not trust themselves, is something that can help to engender hope in patients themselves. It is a true truism that we are only that we are often only able to believe in ourselves if others believe in us. So notice here the really strong emphasis on, uh, on relationality right from the start here. But there are a number of questions we can ask about uh, this, uh, this reappraisal of, uh, of relational uh, processes as a way of effecting uh, uh, better progress. So first of all, we can ask what, what this emphasis means for clinical, critic, clinical care. Uh, well, one thing we can say here is that uh, is the renewed interest in shared decision making based on uh, the individuality of patient values alongside good evidence, uh, whereby the relevant uh, management and so forth is itself procedural in the sense that uh, it, it, it should be established through empathetic dialogue where the uh, where the purpose of such open-ended uh, mutual dialogue is to facilitate recovery. And this, I think, I think really takes us back to Ray's initial uh, prompt here. This idea that recovery is itself something that uh, speaks to uh, a restoration of the quality of life from the point of view of the individual patient, given their stories and situated ecological systems. So I think that's the kind of that's the, the hard, uh, the, the real challenge for, for a public mental health as, as I see it. Now there are a number of concerns that we can raise straight away. What about burnout? What about risk management? Uh, not to mention wider power uh, problems in society to do with epistemic injustices. Uh, gender inequalities and so forth. I take it that those uh, concerns are very much visible on the scene as something that we can't shun away from in taking um, the challenge for developing a new public health approach along these lines seriously. So I just want to note where, the, uh, where I take some of the challenges to be here. Um, I won't talk more about that myself here because uh, my expertise isn't clinical care. Uh, my expertise is rather one of conceptual analysis as a philosophy. So a few things that I want to uh, emphasize here uh, uh, from, a, from a philosophical point of view is really some of the lessons that we can take from social epistemology in mitigating against what is sometimes referred to as epistemic injustice. This idea that we need to take the, uh, the, uh, the patients seriously as a credible knower. And in doing so also requires an emphasis of the reality of the lived experience of mental illness, if we want to use that word, um, from the point of view of the person in question. And I think that's, that's really such a powerful tool that we have at our disposal uh, with the, uh, the uh, 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 a renewed interest in lived experience as expertise. 
um, uh, start with the story, start with the concerns raised from the point of view of that story, and, uh, and then work backwards to see what the relevant um, uh, new requirements are. Um, so if we have that view of the subject uh, as, uh, as precisely not merely a pathologized person uh, who, who may themselves feel that type of othering from the profession, uh, but really uh, reappraise the person as a stakeholder holder, uh, as, as a knower, uh, and also in the knowledge production that we may call co-creative research. So that's the second item here. And there is a third uh, uh, dimension of moral agency in understanding the experience itself and indeed uh, self-knowledge through the use of language as tools. Indeed, if we remember uh, what Ray talked about this morning, it's very easy, easy to uh, self-stigmatize yourself if you, as it were, uh, come to internalize a certain time of pathologized uh, patient narrative. So narrative here uh, can, both, can work both ways. It can precisely uh, um, work against empowerment if you, as it were, internalize the wrong type of language. But it is precisely by making those implicit conceptual commitments explicit that we can also use language as a tool for empowerment, education, and indeed also communication. So yeah, just a few items that I'm interested in as a philosopher. Um, and we can think of them as all belonging to, um, uh, to um, social epistemology, where the type of orientation here is informed by uh, uh, this emphasis of perspective taking and what that risk of perspective taking means for us. Okay. So I think we have some sense of what uh, the challenges are here. So I'm going to give you a new challenge. Uh, this is thinking forward with our initial uh, 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 idea of recovery in the context of personality disorders. So here is a, a, a puzzle that Hannah Pickard uh, races in her article uh, that I want us to think through in the time that remains. So Pickett writes, um, although the hope and belief in a better future no doubt increases the likelihood that it will be realized, clinicians must nonetheless occupy two opposing stances that are difficult to rationally reconcile. They must have imagination and faith, when using narrative understanding to support patients in recovery from personality disorder and at the same time maintain belief in their patients' power of choice and agency. Yet at the same time they must face the evidence that suggests that their faith is misplaced and their belief unwarranted because only then can they help patients create a vision for a new, better life that is realistic to achieve even when clinicians and patients are uh, alike succeed in effectively start striking this balance, their hopes for a better future are often dashed. Okay, so I guess here, here we have this, uh, uh, this um, real fear of risk management. You know, here is my, my patient, they have had so many suicides, I'll, I'll give up. So, I want to move away from that, uh, from, from that perceived uh, uh, incompatibility here. I'll come back to this in a minute. Um, I think in order to move away from that uh, kind of uh, rational conflict, um, I think it is important to reappraise uh, this idea of perspective taking. Um, and in my own work, I follow Iris Murdoch on this point 
simply in uh, reappraising the significance of a wider holistic background uh, for anything for our everyday um, uh, cognitions. So when we're dealing here with uh, patient and doctor relationships, we and if we're doing so in a genuinely uh, relational way, there is an element of trying to operate at a horizontal level as opposed to uh, the standard hierarchical uh, uh, structure. And that in itself uh, involves a risk on both parties, a risk of uh, precisely being seen for, uh, for who you are by the other. Uh, conceptually, we can uh, formulate two conditions as follows. The first one is uh, an epistemic no priority claim about knowledge in, into sub subjective empathetic inquir inquiry, whereby neither perspective of the parties involved is prioritized over the other. Now, this doesn't mean that anything goes, but it really uh, speaks to the importance of listening. You know, before you put somebody in a certain diagnostic box, uh, you need to uh, appreciate uh, the person uh, in question. So that's really what, what is meant here. Uh, that in order to engage with the other, you need to, in some sense, try to see the world from their point of view. Um, the second uh, claim that I wish to propose is about the meaning of individual concepts, uh, be it illness, be it being a patient, uh, be, uh, be it um, being defiant uh, and so forth, um, as something that itself plays a role within the wider interpersonal systems in which they operate. So the simple point here is that there is no such thing as a patient in a vacuum. You know, you become an impatient given a certain uh, context. And likewise with the notion of expertise. Um, and I will return to that point towards, towards the end. Okay, so um, the, uh, uh, what, what this means then is that we have uh, new tasks ahead of us in, in engaging with the other but also a type of uh, uh, challenge in, uh, uh, morally speaking, in attaining this knowledge. And the reason why the, uh, the challenge may be seen as, uh, as morally complex here is that it requires us to uh, adopt a certain stance towards the other, uh, an empathetic stance where you really want to engage in an, a dialogue, where you wish to engage in a relational process in order to see things right. Um, and that's when you actually start thinking about it, it's harder uh, than it may initially sound. Okay. So those are some of the conceptual uh, uh, ideas that I am interested in here, really in, in, uh, as a way of um, understanding um, um, some of the, uh, the significance of uh, what has been, been said in previous talks today. To make this a bit more concrete, uh, uh, here is two different ways in which we may conceptualize some of the uh, uh, challenges about, uh, uh, about uh, regulation that Ray uh, alluded to earlier today. This idea that uh, 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 part of the challenges here can be one of uh, uh, striking, striking a balance uh, in ways that are appropriate circumstances. So here is a, here is a, a fictional account of Martha Martha is an adult patient, an adult inpatient diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. And this, I think, I, I think is quite a, quite a common representation of how borderline, borderline patients 
are in terms of uh, their uh, identity disturbance, so-called, um, and also uh, uh, the perceived challenge in terms of moral agency. So I will read this quote in full because it matters in what follows. Um, and I quote, within Martha's narrative of her life's store history, overdoses were the things that happened. They were the final event in a coherent and well-organized sequence of events that made explanatory sense. But they were not things she did. For instance, when asked in group to describe the lead up to one of her overdoses, Martha eloquently explained how, uh, feeling overwhelmed and like she could bear life no longer, she got into a car and went to buy alcohol and have this before driving to a secluded place only to conclude, and then there was an overdose." End quote. When the group questioned her about why she did not say that she then took an overdose, Martha became defensive and distressed and rushed out of the group. When she returned, she initially refused to speak to the group about why she had left. But when pressed, repeated, reported that early childhood feelings of being the black sheep in the family had been, triggered, had been triggered by the group's questioning and that she had been scared of suffering flashbacks as a result. Now, a couple of things to notice here. So this is a, a made up example that is designed to, uh, to highlight some of the uh, challenges to do with agency and indeed um, one of uh, a disconnect between what you may endorse narratively speaking as your uh, aim uh, as your identity and things that you do as a result of your condition so this is a typical representation as to how persons with BPD in particular they're just in it for the ride they don't take any responsibility for their actions and so Forth. Okay, so bear that in mind um, and now contrast that, that with the following report. This is a self-report uh, from a person uh, on a peer forum. So this is a peer, peer support forum for um, borderline personality disorders. So you can think of this as a kind of, uh, just ask for advice from your, your peers, yeah? So here is how this self-report in a similar vein uh, is, uh, is, uh, 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 was put on this forum. And this is an authentic uh, self-report, I should ask. I quote again, um, I keep reading from nonce, which I take to mean non-borderliners, that BPDs are completely incapable of any introspection. I don't agree with this. I know that I certainly have times of introspection and I'm actually a fairly introspective person, constantly analyzing myself and my behavior. I also deny a lot uh, of aspects about myself, but at least I am aware that there are things that I am in, deny in denial about, right? I don't know, I suspected BPD long before being diagnosed. Maybe all the reading I've done about the condition has given me better introspection. But I feel like I have always been fairly introspective. The problem for me isn't recognizing the behavior, well, I'm fine. It's being able to change it once I am in those emotions. I am aware, I just feel completely out of control of my actions. It's like I can still hear the rational voice, but that rational voice has zero control of me. Does anyone else feel this way? How introspective are you? Do you think real introspection is possible for borderline personality disorder? Okay, so the point of this uh, self-report was to give you a rather contrasting story uh, for how some of the challenges uh, of, uh, uh, of regulation can be perceived from, from within. Uh, and notice here in particular how that type of representation is not one of lacking agency, it's one of you know, being able to control uh, your actions. So it's a breakdown rather 
uh, between um, uh, self uh, self awareness on the one hand and its practical link in uh, into uh, practical agency. Not a problem with self identity as such, or so I claim. Okay, so. Uh, I don't know how much time I got left here, but we can think of an, a similar story here. And this would be a similar example of how the way we describe these challenges uh, really matters for, uh, for, uh, for engaging with one another uh, in a relational way. Anna, we're into final thoughts territory. That's great. So I think I will leave you with that thought um, um, and we can talk together about this in what follows.